You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is. Jacob Ball. Hello. Sports fans. Welcome to another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am Jacob Volk. And there's not a lot to get to today, but there is a lot to get to, if that makes any sense. We've got a couple interesting proposals to break down, so that's going to take up the whole show. I can promise you that. So I'm just going to jump right into it. Major League Baseball's 2020 Operations Manual. I'll go over the bullet points. This is from Joel Sherman and Ken Davidoff of the New York Post. I'm not going to go through the bullet points verbatim. I'll just give Cliff Notes version of them and go in depth on them if I need to. The first one is to social distance before and during the game. Okay, that was to be expected. You know, we're probably going to have players waiting in the stands, believe it or not, instead of sitting in the dugout. It wouldn't surprise me at all if we had, like, a rotating system where some players wait in the stands and other players wait in the dugout. And those guys just rotate based on how close they are to going up at bat. I don't mind that. I mean, we have to social distance if we're going to bring back sports. So, okay. I can live with that. If there are no fans in the stands, I can live with it. No lineup cards will be uh, exchanged. They will be entered into an app provided by Major League Baseball. Okay, fine. I can live with that. All non-playing personnel must wear masks, obviously. Um, No touching their face with their hands. Um, Even if you're giving signs, which I have an issue remembering. I don't know why, but I've... I feel like I touch my face a lot. I know that's terrible. Um, so that's going to be tough. No wiping away sweat with their hands. I don't know how that's going to work. What if you're playing in Florida in August? What on earth are you going to do there? You know how hot Miami gets? You can't lick your fingers. Okay, fine. Unless you're eating barbecue, there's no reason to lick your fingers. Don't whistle with your fingers. That's not how I whistle anyway. I just uh, do it with my mouth. And no spinning. Okay, fine. That's not sanitary anyway. Any ball that's put in play and touched by multiple players um, will be removed. Okay, that's fine. It'll slow down the game a little bit, but okay. After an out, players are strongly discouraged from throwing the ball around the infield. Again, that's perfectly fine. Pitchers should bring their own rosin bag to the mound. Okay. Batters should have their own pine tar and batting donuts. Again, perfectly fine. When the ball goes out of play... Fielders are encouraged to retreat several steps away from the base runner. Likewise, between pitches. 
See, this is the big thing to me. How are you going to social distance while playing the game? Think about a hitter at bat. The catcher is not six feet away from the batter. And the home plate umpire is not six feet away from the catcher or the batter. It's going to be like the old days where the home plate umpire sits in a lawn chair six feet behind the catcher. That actually used to be a thing, by the way. In the 1800s, the home plate umpire would sit in a lawn chair. How are you going to hold runners on? What, is there just an informal agreement that you're not going to steal? Or, hey, look, I'm thinking of stealing right now, but let me take a six-foot lead? What's the average lead? Is it six feet? I actually don't know. How are you going to turn double plays? How are you going to deal with pop-ups in no man's land? The shallow outfield. First and third base coaches must remain in or behind the coach's box. Okay, that's fine. I really don't mind that. The Yankees had a third base coach by the name of Joe Espada that would go so far out of the coach's box it wasn't even funny. He'd go like halfway down the line to wave a runner in and then he'd come running towards the coach's box to wave the runner in. It was really a sight to see. Fighting and instigating fights are strictly prohibited. Okay, fine. Players mustn't make physical contact with others for any reason unless it's a, quote, normal and permissible, unquote, part of the action. Look, Major League Baseball doesn't want these guys touching anyway. They've put rules in to stop um, runners from breaking up double plays, from collisions at home plate. They don't like that anyway. This is just an excuse to further it. I get it. I really can't hate it too much. Using the indoor hitting cage is discouraged. A lot of players use that hitting cage. I will tell you right now, I know for a fact that there are a lot of players that are going to object to that. A lot of players do that if they know they're not going to be at bat anytime soon to stay loose. Or if you've been in a slump, you spend extra time in the hitting cage. A lot of players do that. No saunas, steam rooms, hydrotherapy pools, or cryotherapy chambers at the ballpark. Okay. I mean, I guess you can live with that. Don't high-five, fist bump, or hug while on team property. It's going to be fun to see the celebrations there. I guess it's not the end of the world, though. And don't shower at the ballpark. Can you imagine? You're playing a game in Arizona. It's 100 degrees. And you have to fly to, let's say, New York. You're playing the Mets. You just played the Diamondbacks. You're going to play the Mets next. Can you imagine how smelly that plane is going to be? Oh, my God. If you own stock in nose plug companies, you're a very happy man right now. How can you say to players, don't shower? Yeah, here's here's an idea. Let's rent a fire truck and let's just hose all the players down. Look, these players need to get clean if they're... Oh my god, I feel so weird talking about this. If... If players are running around in Arizona, 100 degree heat in August, and then they're going to sit on a flight to go to New York, that plane is going to be a hazard. 
There will be people in hazmat suits deep cleaning it. When you're renting the bus to go to the hotel, the bus driver's going to think a stink bomb went off in his bus. This isn't going to happen, all right? There's no way that you can say to players, don't shower after games. Maybe you don't need to every game. I mean, look, if you're in a cold spot and you really didn't sweat a lot, you didn't move a lot, you're the designated hitter, and you went 0 for 4 or something, maybe you don't need to shower that day. I can understand that. But if you're an outfielder or something and you're running around a lot and you had a good day with the bat, you got a couple extra base hits, yeah, you're going to need to shower. Buy nose plugs. That's the best advice I can give you. If you're working with these guys. No mascots to limit personnel at the ballpark. Okay, I can live with that. The scoreboard will limit advanced video and statistics while not featuring replays or out-of-town scores at all. If there are no fans in the stands, that's perfectly fine. You shouldn't scoreboard watch anyway if you're a player. I know some do, but you really shouldn't. I can live with that. No bat boys or ball boys. Those duties will be performed by existing team employees. Okay, that's perfectly fine. The entire team must stay in the same hotel. Members of the traveling party are prohibited from traveling or leaving the hotel for any reason besides going to the game in any manner without team approval. The second sentence of that is kind of redundant. You shouldn't be traveling anyway without team approval. I mean, I guess in the old days, if you wanted to go to a strip club or something or a bar, you didn't need to get team approval. But if you wanted to go out to dinner after the game, you didn't need team approval for that. So look, I get that second part. It's kind of redundant, but whatever. The entire team must stay in the same hotel. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. It's going to be interesting to see how that applies to home teams. Are they going to force the home teams to stay in a hotel? Or are they going to be allowed to go to their houses? Because if the Yankees are playing in New York, they don't stay in a hotel, obviously. They're staying in their homes and they're just driving to and from the stadium. That's going to be kind of interesting to see how that works out. Teams are encouraged to use smaller private airports when possible. I don't know of any Major League Baseball team that flies commercial. If there is one, shame on the owner. Use regular crews for their flights and don't hire pilots and flight attendants who fly commercial. Or if you have to, hire them as little as possible. I don't know enough about flying privately to say whether that's going to happen or not. I mean, you'd be surprised how many small airports there are in this country that you never hear about. Like, in the middle of nowhere, there will be an airport. And you think to yourself, wait, why is that airport there? And sometimes it actually has an interesting history. Now, I don't know if they're still active. I don't know how many flights go there a day. But, hey, look, if you can land a plane there safely, there's no reason why you can't uh, do that. 
It's just a matter of, is the runway long enough? Because if you're chartering a big plane, a lot of those rural airports can't handle big planes. They handle small Cessnas. So I guess it could happen. It's just going to be logistically challenging. Clubs should try to book their teams on low floors of hotels in order to avoid riding shared elevators and ensure that hotels provide a private dining area for the traveling party, none of whom will be allowed to eat outside that area. Folks, we're living in Big Brother. Okay? I'm expecting Julie Chen Moonves to pop out and say, expect the unexpected. I guess it's not a big deal. It's just kind of weird to see in writing. And in practice, it'll be interesting to see how it works. No one can use the hotel gym or a shared facility, so... No pools, no saunas... No hotel, restaurant, nothing. Again, you know, this goes back to the Big Brother aspect. I mean, at some point you're going to need to say to these players, you know, we're trusting you to do the right thing. You can't dictate everything they do. All right, these are grown men we're talking about here. I understand that safety comes first, and if there's one person who goes outside and acts like an idiot, then that ruins it for everyone. I understand that, but, you know, we can't wrap all these guys in bubble wrap and protect them. All right, these are grown men here. At some point, personal responsibility comes into play. You can only travel to and from the ballpark via your own vehicle or the team bus. So no Ubers, Lyfts, taxis, um, trains, public buses, you name it. A sufficient number of buses will be provided to and from the ballpark to ensure everyone will have an empty seat next to him or her. I guess that's not a big deal. The only thing I'll say is a lot of players use rideshare apps and a lot of players carpool. So, I mean, that's going to be rough. There are some players that will take trains to the game. Um, Very rarely you hear those stories. Taxis, I guess it's possible. Rideshare apps, again, I guess it's possible. I mean, look, these players are millionaires at the end of the day, or at least a lot of them are. They can't afford a car. Or at the very least, you can rent one for this shortened season and then give it back for a deep cleaning. I mean, that's just more inconvenient than anything else. It can be done, it's just a giant pain in the butt. Upon arriving at spring training for the second time, all players and support staff must undergo a screening 48 to 72 hours prior to the report date. Temperatures will be taken with a contactless thermometer. So, like, you point the thermometer at the forehead... You hit the trigger and it gives you your temperature. That's perfectly fine. Either a saliva or nasal swab test will be administered and so will a blood test. It's kind of funny. The union in the past has rejected blood tests. I understand that was for drug testing, but it's going to be interesting to see how they deal with the blood test aspect of that. Those tested must self-quarantine until they receive results. 
So that should be within 24 to 48 hours. It's important to note there that this is before spring training really picks up. So we're not talking during the season. This is before spring training. So it's not like you're going to see a hitter pulled out of a game because he has to take a test. This is just spring training. Again, I can live with that. That's perfectly fine. A negative test will allow a player to join spring training. A positive test would lead to the person being placed in self-isolation. Pretty self-explanatory there. Players will have their temperatures taken twice daily and screening for the virus multiple times a week will occur. Any individual with a temperature more than 100 degrees or symptoms of the virus will be subject to immediate screening for COVID-19. See, here's the kicker to this. Major League Baseball is going to need hundreds of thousands of tests to make this happen. No one loves baseball more than me, but even I'm willing to say that those tests should be better allocated. Until we have the ability to produce hundreds of millions of tests daily, or at the very least have a surplus of tests, I can't say that this is the best use of resources. You know, there are a lot of people out there who need to go back to work more than these players. While I understand that not all of them are millionaires and This is eating into their savings. I get that. I get that. I promise I do. There are a lot of people going hungry. A lot of people with families that are barely, barely scraping by. These tests could be so better allocated. At some point, you do have an ethical responsibility to say, yeah, we can't take all these tests. Let's give them back to the people who need them the most. Free diagnostics will be provided for those who live in the household of individuals with ballpark access. Okay, that's nice, but again, you know, you're taking it out of the hands of people who really need it. Players will be provided thermometers to use each morning twice consecutively, then be required to register the results in a database. I don't mind that, but it again goes back to the Orwellian aspect of this. You know, how comfortable are you going to be putting in your medical records like that? I don't even like the fact that my medical records are kept online so that other doctors can see them. It just makes me feel like it can be hacked and other people can see it. I understand that it's secure and I have no problem with my um, internist talking to my cardiologist or my chiropractor talking to my uh, gastroenterologist. But it's just a little disconcerting to me that that's all online. So that if you're in the same hospital network, you can see it. I don't know why. It just creeps me out a little bit. I wonder how the players would feel about it. All right, this is the big one to me. MLB won't formally restrict off-field activities, but will encourage those who are part of the game to avoid areas such as crowded bars, clubs, and restaurants. And other areas where there are a lot of people. Well, wait a minute. Of course you are. Of course you're restricting it. Go back to what it says before. Members of the traveling party 
are prohibited from traveling or leaving the hotel for any reason besides going to the game in any manner without team approval. Of course you're forbidding it. Oh, it's not Major League Baseball that's prohibiting it? It's the teams that are prohibiting it? Okay, fine, make them the bad guys. I mean, that's what you're saying. That's ridiculous. Don't delegate this to the teams. You have to rule with an iron fist here. Look, I understand that you don't want to be George Orwell and, you know, live in a 1984 type situation, but you need to be the big guy in charge here, Major League Baseball, not the teams. If Garrett Cole is allowed to do something that Pete Alonso isn't, just because they play on different teams, that's wrong. Quite frankly, I don't like the fact that governors of states are being allowed to dictate when to reopen. It should be the federal government. Each team physician must identify all those more likely to suffer severe illness from getting the coronavirus due to age or underlying conditions. That's nice. Additional accommodations must be provided for such people, and if they still don't feel comfortable assuming the health risk, they don't have to participate in the coming season. Does that apply to players that aren't high risk? Is Blake Snell high risk? If he isn't, how does this apply to him? He's already said he doesn't want to play. We can argue about how he said it all we want. It's a different argument. He doesn't feel safe playing. Okay. Perfectly understandable. So wait a minute. You're allowing the high risk people not to participate, which is the right decision, but if I'm low risk, but I still don't feel safe, I'm screwed? I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Think about it this way. Let's say you're walking into a room where 99 out of 100 times you walk into that room, there's a million dollars sitting on a table, but that One other time, there's a Bengal tiger on the loose. There are some people that won't go into that room, even though there's a 99% chance you're walking out of there with a million dollars. There are some people that will be afraid of that 1% chance. If you're saying that the high-risk individuals don't need to participate, which is the right decision, you need to... Open it up to everyone who really doesn't feel safe. Even if they're low risk. It's just that simple. You can't discriminate. If someone needs to get tested at an off-site medical facility, that facility can't be a hospital or clinic that's been treating COVID-19 patients. Good luck finding one of those. I don't know how many of those exist. Teams will be limited to 50 players in spring training. Okay, that's perfectly fine. Teams that use a major league stadium should stagger the times of workouts throughout the day to avoid overcrowding and use other facilities like colleges. I mean, I can live with that, but security is going to be a nightmare. You're going to have to provide security at the regular spring training complex plus the college ballpark that you're renting out. It can be done. It's just a giant pain in the neck. And the last one is all spring training games in Florida and Arizona will begin at 7 p.m. or 9 p.m. local time to account for the heat. Do that for all games if you don't want these guys showering. Look, what's important to note about all this is 
the fact that we can't turn this game into a circus. All right, go back to the socially distancing while you're in the dugout. So you're going to have to sit in the uh, stands. You can't turn the game into a sideshow with players rotating and doing all these weird things that just take away from the beauty of the game. At the end of the day, you can't put elements in place that lessen the game. The sanctity of the game needs to come first. And if we have to jump through all these hoops to get it done, at some point, it becomes not worth it. At some point, you just need to say, we're better off skipping the season. We're better off not participating in a sideshow. It's tough. It's really sad. But if this is what it takes to get a season going, socially distancing at every turn, having Big Brother track you 24-7 if you're a baseball player, it becomes not worth it. At some point, you know, you have to trust these players. They're either going to get sick or they're not. Now, I understand if one person gets sick, it ruins it for everyone. One bad apple spoils a bunch. I understand that. But you can't turn the game into a sideshow. I mean, it's bad enough that this season is going to have an asterisk on it to certain people. And I'm on the fence about it myself. But if we impose all these crazy rules, it just furthers the argument of the people who are of the opinion that this season will have an asterisk. All in all, if these are the hoops we need to jump through, it may not be worth it. And it kills me to say that. Okay, that took longer than I expected. I'll end with this story. Potential changes to the Rooney Rule. Now, these are proposed changes that will be voted on tomorrow. Here are the resolutions according to Jim Trotter of NFL.com. If a team hires a minority head coach, that team in the draft preceding the coach's second season. So you can't fire a minority head coach after one year. You got to wait two seasons with him, at least, to get this benefit. You'd move up six spots from where it's slotted to pick in the third round. A team would jump 10 spots under the same scenario for hiring a person of color as its primary football executive. So that could be as a GM, president of football operations, whatever. If a team were to fill both positions with diverse candidates in the same year, that club could jump 16 spots. Six for the coach and 10 for the GM. So you could move from the top of the third round to the middle of the second round. Another incentive is a team's fourth round pick would climb five spots in the draft preceding the coach's or GM's third year if he's still with the team. I understand that we need to have more minorities as head coaches or chief decision makers in the NFL. The Rooney Rule 
as it stands right now, has failed. The fact that Eric Bieniemy isn't a head coach is insane to me. But here's the big issue here. You're going to have a lot of teams hiring undeserving candidates because of this. At the end of the day, there are only so many qualified minorities to run a football team, whether it's as a head coach or a GM. The Fritz Pollard Alliance puts out a list of suggested candidates every year. A lot of those names aren't good. I remember after Hugh Jackson was fired by the Browns, they had him on their next list. I mean, this goes into an affirmative action argument. Would you rather have a less qualified minority or a more qualified Caucasian? I understand the need for diversity. I get it. But I'll tell you right now. If the Jets were to fire Adam Gase after next year for whatever reason, if he goes 0-16, fire him. But if he's fired and replaced by, let's say, Chris Richard, and Joe Douglas says there may have been more deserving candidates out there who were Caucasian, but we hired this guy because we wanted the draft benefit, I am going to flip my lid. There is no excuse to not hire the most deserving candidate for the job. It doesn't matter what their race is, their gender, whatever. Their sexual orientation, it doesn't matter. This isn't the way to fix the Rooney Rule. And you want to tell me six spots isn't a big jump? It's a huge jump. Think about it this way. If you're the team that gets jumped and the team that jumps you takes the guy you want, you are going to be so upset, it's not even funny. The Jets coveted Denzel Mims at the end of the second round. If they got jumped, every Jets fan in the world would have been screaming their heads off. Look, I don't mind the idea of incentivizing teams to hire minorities. Maybe if you want to give them a little extra salary cap room, or you make a donation in their name to a charity, I don't mind that. Even if you want to give them, like, an extra pick or something like that in the compensatory portion of whatever round you want, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, or seventh, I don't mind that. But these jumps are too much. That's not the right way to fix this. The consequence of this is going to be that you have... A lot of unqualified people getting these jobs just because they're minorities. Well, wait a minute. I have 20 years as a really high up person in this front office, and you're passing me for someone who has five years as an area scout just because that scout is a minority, and I'm Caucasian? That would tick me off a lot. It goes to the heart of affirmative action. It's a political issue that I really don't want to deal with now. I'm okay with incentivizing teams to hire minorities. I understand that it's a big issue. But this isn't the right way to do it. I like the idea of giving them more room to work with when it comes to the salary cap. I think that's 
the best way to do it. Tomorrow, you're definitely going to get the trifecta. I'd be stunned if there was enough sports news to break in the interim that would cause me to not do the trifecta. Until tomorrow, I am Jacob Vaux saying that Charles Finley was a self-made man who worshipped his creator.